Hi, welcome to the second part of Lecture 9 of ECE 141, Practical Considerations in Digital Transmission. So, just a review of the noisy channel. We treated the channel as just a block that, add, that adds noise. As you can see here, your transmitted pulse signal is received with some noise N of T. Uh, in reality though, a real-world channel is band-limited Therefore, it has an impulse response H of T. Okay? So, in wideband communication, what does that mean? Digital signals are considered wideband because they need a large bandwidth just to be transmitted. Okay? And if you want a higher data rate, you need a larger bandwidth. Okay? So, since our channel has an impulse response, the received signal at the receiver is equal to your the convolution of your transmitted signal with the channel filter. Okay. And because our signal is wideband and your, LTA, your filter response has some shape in the frequency domain, some different components of your signal from your wideband digital signal will experience different frequency response. It will experience a different attenuation. Will be, some will be amplified, some will be attenuated, and so on and so forth. Okay? Because of this, there's an inherent intersymbol interference within the channel. Okay? The channel as an LTI filter is causal, first and foremost. Our model for the channel is its causal. So basically, it should not have any value before anything is injected into it. It's also dispersive. So the input cannot stay at one time, right? So it cannot be, it should not be an impulse function right here. It, the, any energy that will be injected into the channel will be dispersed by, because of channel effects, right? Your input cannot stay in the channel for too long. So most of the energy is inside this sum interval TD, right? Where TD is what we call time dispersion or the delay spread. Since we are dealing with digital transmission, we should model the channel into, the, into a discrete time first before we analyze it. So what would be the effect of a band limited channel with an LTI filter to our digital sig signals. So first, let's look at the pulse shaped signal. So this is your PAM signal with some pulse shape. Upconvert that. Right? So recall the upconversion process. Right? So transmit that over an LTI channel. That means we convolved. So we convolve the channel response to some X of T, which is equivalent to this. So you have a baseband representation, complex baseband representation of your LTI channel. And if we down convert that, we have this complex baseband expression, HB convolved with your baseband XB. Okay. After our uh, RX filter, basically your XB, your uh, receive signal will be convolved with the uh, RX filter Q. And uh, since convolution is a linear operation and associative and commutative, we can flip these uh, operands inside the operation. So let your uh, x b convolve to your q. So substitute the expression for x b, which is this. Your p convolved to q becomes g right here, and it will be convolved to H B of T and you have a sum of that over all the transmitted symbols. Okay? And then we discretize that, right? So since we have a summation here, we can now discretize that. Okay? So our received symbol UM is equal to this. You have your impulse response H D of L multiplied to past uh, symbols right here, past transmitted symbols. And then finally, you add your Gaussian noise. 
So what does this expression mean? So you have a sum of your impulse response at a certain L, certain time TL, sorry, certain time L, which is the difference M minus K, okay, and multiplied to your past symbol. This is how you interpret it. If your symbol is narrow band, then that means it has a wide pulse, like this. If your symbol is wide band, then it means it's a narrow pulse. If we pass it through the same channel with the same impulse response, copies of the first transmitted symbol will be uh, transmitted or will be dispersed over the channel. So this is this uh, large one, large violet one here, corresponds to this impulse response. Because of dispersion, another will be uh, created right here. So this is H of 0. This is H of 1. Right, we model it now as impulse uh, responses, H of 2, and so on and so forth. This creates an image of the first pulse right here. This creates an image of the second pulse right here. And a third smaller one right here. And uh, the, the energy of this will be dispersed completely before we transmit the uh, signal number two. And same pattern is created. But if we transmit a wideband signal, as you can see, the first symbol right here, very small pulse, will be will become this one. Okay, it will become this signal, and an image of this signal will be created because of the channel impulse response, which becomes this. Okay, which interferes with the transmitted symbol X two. So you, basically, we transmitted X two too soon, and you create intersymbol interference between the first symbol x1 and x2 so the first symbol has not yet stopped transmitting because of the channel but since we want a wide band or we want high data rate we transmitted symbol 2 already even if symbol 1 hasn't stopped transmitting yet so that's the interpretation this is the time domain in the frequency domain it looks like this your h of f has a certain shape in the frequency domain so is your narrow band and wide band signals. Your narrow band has a small bandwidth, and the wide band has a large bandwidth. Since we are filtering between your input to your output, then our frequency responses will be multiplied to each other. The narrow band signal will be approximately the same, still look the same. So it doesn't have that much distortion if you compare. But your wide band signal will be will become smaller. This is the effect of transmitting a high data rate over a band limited channel. So the narrow band signal is does not have an intersymbol interference. Therefore, we can let go of the other terms and we just model it such that the transmitted symbol UM is the only one that has an effect at your received symbol VM. A wide band signal, on the other hand, we'll have a summation of all the past L-1 symbols that was transmitted depending on how long the dispersion of your impulse response is. And uh, you have your desired sig signal right here plus some intersymbol interference. So this is your this is this, uh, the sum of all or the accumulation of all the previous symbols creates an intersymbol interference. And if you have an accumulation at the output, then to reverse this accumulation, you need to be able to do a maximum likelihood sequence detection, therefore complicating your channel. So how do we reverse the effect of the LTI channel? So a suboptimal approach to mitigate the intersymbol interference is to use what we call equalizers. So basically, we design our uh, receiving filter right here such that it will cancel out the intersymbol interference. That's it. So we design an optimal filter for 
reducing intersymbol interference. Okay. So the design of this filter requires an objective if we want to optimize it. Should we optimize the bit error rate? That's difficult. It's hard to analyze. If we optimize the energy, maybe better. Since energy it does not have any statistical, uh, does not have that much statistical significance compared to probabilities of, probability of bit error. So with that, we'll select what we call the signal to interference and noise ratio at the filtered output right here, WM. So first, let's look at, let's say we transmitted a vector uh, or a sequence of symbols u1, u2, up to u sub n. Okay, We have a set of received symbols right here. The first one does not have any interference. The second one has an interference with u1 and so on and so forth until you reach the end. Uh, this is actually a very difficult visualization. Maybe we can simplify it using filters. So by using filters, we simplify the approach. Our received vector will now be equal to this. Okay. So with this, our symbol WM can be extracted from this representation. It will be equal to this signal right here convolved with our linear equalizer which is basically just if we convolve them you just get the Hermitian transpose of the matrix GM or the the weights of this times your received signal V so this is an approach to filter optimization okay so we break that down, this V, substitute the previous expression. We have this, the desired signal, this, your inter symbol interference, and a filtered noise, which is equal to this. So the goal of the equalizer is to maximize this SINR. It should be very large. So our SINR becomes this. The signal power is equal to this. Basically, this inner product with itself the interference power is this inner product with itself. And the noise power is this inner product with itself. You get these three expressions right here. Without loss of generality, the magnitude of our linear equalizer should be less than or equal to 1. So the maximum value should be equal to 1. So first, let's consider two cases. The low SNR and high SNR. So... Since we have a low SNR, that means we neglect the effect of intersymbol interference. Since at low SNR, the, the energy of our transmission is very small such that the images of our ISI or our intersymbol interference becomes drowned in noise. Okay, So we, this term disappears in SINR. And then we only maximize this expression. This ES and N0 are constants, so we can only maximize this term. Okay. And to maximize this term, we need to match HM and GM. So GM must be a matched filter of HM to maximize our SINR and basically maximize our SNR. So we maximize our signal, our SNR, by having a matched filter. And this is actually a general case. That's why that's one reason why you need a matched filter at the receiver so that your uh, SNR is maximized. Okay. Now, if we have high SNR, then the noise term disappears. So the noise term disappears. We need to maximize this expression. So ES will be canceled out. And we want to maximize this expression right here. Okay. So basically, we want to force HI to be 0 if it's convolved with GM. So we have to find a way such that H, all HI, where I not equal to M, will be 0. That's why we call it zero forcing maximization or zero forcing filter. So we want to force this to be 0 
and that is when our filter weights or our filter response is equal to this expression right here. Okay. So the geometric interpretation of that looks like this. The match filter, we want to maximize that. We want to maximize our signal with respect to HM. Okay, so it, that means we need to align the response GM to the weights of HM. Okay, but if we want to force HM to be zero, this the response of our filter should be the response of our filter should be nine in uh, orthogonal to our orthogonal to our matched filter h sub m okay that's the geometric interpretation but in terms of frequency domain this is the easier one we just want to invert the channel such that our information will become flat again so if the information signal is convolved with the channel it becomes this it will have a shape its frequency response will have a shape that's like this and at the receiver, we want it to become flat again. That's why we use an equalizer that cancels out the effect of the channel. Okay? However, the noise becomes enhanced due to this effect. Okay? At some point, at some part of the frequency spectrum, the noise becomes much larger than the signal. So if the channel response is too bad, the noise will be significantly enhanced. And that's the effect of zero forcing. If this is the case when we have high SNR. If you want, if you have low SNR, it won't work. Okay. So the general case is if we maximize the SINR or basically we minimize the mean square error. We define the mean square error as basically this right here, epsilon m. So recall the SINR, the, the term here at the denominator right here. This is the mean square error. Okay. If we minimize that, then we maximize our SINR. And that filter or the filter response of your minimum mean square error is equal to this expression right here. Okay, so the minimum mean square error equalizer has a filter response or filter weights that is uh, solved through this expression right here. Okay, and basically if uh, we plot them in their subspace, it's basically in between your matched filter and your zero forcing filter. So in this case, at any high uh, at a high SNR, if we use MMSE, at high SNR, your MMSE becomes closer to your zero forcing filter. If at low SNR, your maximum mean square er minimum mean square error rather becomes a matched filter. Okay, so basically your MMSE adjusts depending on the signal to noise ratio of our signal signal to interference and noise ratio of the filter okay of the signal rather so it's a kind of an adaptive filter because the filter adapts depending on the state of our signal so that's the end of part two okay so again if you have any questions comments or any if you want any clarification with the lecture do not hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below thank you for listening i'll see you next meeting